Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word this night, written in our heart, written in our minds. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will take hold of it and do it. It will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you, we've begun to talk to you about the subject of conquering. Conquering in your life, we talked about it on Sunday morning. We talked about in Revelation 2 and 3, as we're presently talking, how important it is to understand what's being said there, because before the judgment comes to the world, the judgment is going to come to the church. We know that from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. While most of the Christians out there in the world is waiting for Jesus to come and the judgment upon the world, they don't understand what the Scripture says. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. What's the house of God? That's the church. It's going to begin at the house of God first. And if it begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Therefore, judgment is going to come to the church before it comes to the world. Because the church that Jesus is going to present to himself, what kind of a church is he going to present when he comes? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27 says, he's going to present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. There's a lot of work to do in the body of Christ to bring it to that point. There will be a remnant who is going to be that way. But God is going to deal with the church because he's going to have a holy church to present unto himself. And so, when we look at Revelation, Revelation is the book of judgment. And we see that where does the judgment come first? In Revelation 2 and 3, it comes to the churches. And then Revelation 4 on talks about the judgment that comes to the world. Well, we're talking about conquering in our life, and we've seen many scriptures as we've looked at the word makao in the Greek, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, says, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes, and the word overcome is the word makao, which means to conquer or carry off the victory. Are you born of God? If you're born of God, then this is speaking to you. You are to conquer and carry off the victory not just once in a while, all the time. Because this word, makao, is in the present tense. You who are here for the first time, I bring forth in this program, a tremendous program, the tense voice and mood of the verbs when it's important, like in this case, to show you what's being said. There's seven tenses, and the present tense is very important to note. You don't see it in the English versions. You don't understand it unless you know what's being said. But the word present tense, the, the, the verb in the present tense, means continuous, ongoing action. So this word is saying, whatsoever is born of God is continually conquering and carrying off the victory of the world. That's what God wants for us. And this is the victory that continually conquers and overcomes the world. It's also in the present tense. It's our faith. Your faith is going to enable you to conquer and carry off the victory in every area of your life. God wants you to get the victory. He does not want you to be defeated by the enemy. He does not want you to, to see the enemy be triumphing over you in any aspect. No. The will of God is for you to have victory at all times. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57, we see a statement of what the Lord does for us now, experientially, as we're obeying His word. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this word giveth is in the present tense in the Greek, denoting continuous, repeated, ongoing action. So what it's saying is thanks be to God, who is giving unto us, as Young's brings out, which is we always put up the YLT, which is Young's living tra little translation that shows very closely to the Greek many, many times. <coughs> who is giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 14, where it says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. And that's also in the present tense. That means God doesn't have any losing or failures. When we do what He says, 
we're going to be successful. We're going to triumph. We're going to conquer the enemy. We're going to carry off the victory. That's what God wants for us in our life. He is the one who will bring that forth. And we've talked about the fact that we are more than a conqueror out of Romans chapter 8, verse 37. We've seen in 1 John 4, 4, that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. We've seen the fact that you and I are now to conquer sin, conquer the flesh, conquer the devil, conquer everything that would come against us. And we can do that. Jesus conquered the world, and you and I can conquer the world because he has come on the inside of us. We also saw that if this is going to happen, 1 John chapter 2 gives us some revelation that's important. In verse 14 it says, I've written to you fathers because you've known him that's from the beginning. I've written unto you young men because you are strong. The word strong in the Greek is the word iskeros, which actually means mighty and forceful. Strong having might and force. And I've written unto you young men because you are mighty and forceful. And the Word of God abides in you. See, that's what's going to produce that. When the Word's in you, the power of God will be resonant in you, and that can manifest out of you with mighty force. And he says, and you have conquered the, the wicked one. That's a good testimony. God wants to conquer the enemy in our life. He wants us to walk in victory. So that means we're going to put on the whole armor of God. We talked about that through the Word in us, in our heart and mind, mouth, directing our steps, so that we walk in line with the Word of God and we release the power of God out of us. Then we were talking about the other uses of this word, nikao, and important to realize that in the letters to the seven churches, in Revelation 2 and in Revelation 3, that each one of these statements that are made after Jesus speaks to them about the good things they were doing and then corrects them and then tells them in the end uh, what he wants to happen, we see the fact that he talks about conquering. Because he says, to him that overcometh, it's the same word, nikao, conquer. And again, this is also the present tense, the one who's continually conquering, not just once in a while. God wants us to understand that he is a God who is going to manifest himself in your life and walk with you every day as you walk in line with his word. And he, to him that continually conquers, it's literally what it says, will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's a tremendous blessing. And then verse 10, he talks about, or verse 11 it is, he, con he that conquers shall not be heard of the second death, which is separation from the Father. Boy, we want to be sure of that. We don't have any evil stuff happening to us. We see down in verse 17, him that conquers will eat of the hidden man and give him a white stone and a stone and a new name, a new, in the stone a new name written which no man knows, saith, saying he that receiveth. And then we saw down in verse 26, the one who conquers, again, these are all present tense continually, and keeps my works in the end to him will I give power. It's the word exousia, which actually means authority. Give us authority over the nations. You see, what you're doing today is going to have effect in your standing in the life to come. That's why it's so important that we walk with the Lord and conquer. You conquer now, you're going to be in a position to be put in authority over the nations in the life to come. And he says, you'll rule them with a rod of iron. The vessels of the potter shall be broken to shivers, even I as I've received of my Father. We also see in, over in uh, chapter 3, in verse 5, quite a statement that's made for the one who conquers. He that conquers continually the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That's what we're going to get. They'll come back with Jesus. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. That's quite a statement. That implies that he could blot someone's name out of the book of life. But he's not going to blot his name, a person's name out of the book of life if they are overcoming and conquering the enemy. Instead, he says, I'm going to confess your name before my father, before his angels. And of course, that's what we want. And we see down in verse 12, the one who conquers is going to be made a pillar in the temple of my God. We're going to be in the very temple of God. We're going to not go no more out. I'll write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and his new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I'll write upon him my new name. And then we see for the last one, down in verse 21, the one who conquers, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Looking at that, that's very important. We need to be sure that we are conquering so that we see these blessings come forth in our life. 
Well, we were talking about <laughs> Revelation 2 and into Revelation 3 about the things that are important because the things that he spoke of, and you know, several of you weren't here, but we don't really have time to go back through everything, but he talks to each one of them in all of the seven letters. The first thing he says to them is about their works. I know thy works. Literally, it means, says, I have known thy works. He's looking back at our works. It's in a perfect tense verb. He knows all the things that we have done. And that's, of course, what he's looking at us. Is when the Lord comes to judge the church, he's going to be looking at all of our works. And he's seeing, what kind of a life have you been leading? What have you been doing? What kind of works have you been carrying out in your life? And we talked about the labor, the patience, how we can't stand evil and we are going to test those that say they're apostles and found them liars and saw how we're going to, many things that we talked about how we're going to be patient and labored and not fainted we went over all these areas the same time we talked about how he corrected these guys and said I've somewhat against thee because you left your first love they quit following after their first love which was Jesus and the word of God doing it I meant they had a second love they got it replaced by something else we cannot allow that to happen in our life. And he tells them to remember where you've fallen from, repent and do the first works. If Jesus is your first love, then you're going to be doing the first works, the things that you have done. If we aren't doing things like we maybe once have done when we receive the Word of God, we need to repent and come back to doing these things because the Lord is looking at all of our lives, and it's a very important. He even says, quite a judgment, or else I'm going to come to you quickly and remove your candlestick out of his place except you repent. He talks about hating the deeds of Nicolaitans, which are the ones that want to conquer the people and control and dominate and manipulate people. Unfortunately, we have a lot of that going on in the body of Christ. Then he comes on and he talks about knowing the works again in Revelation 2.9. And their pressure, the tribulation, the pressure that they've gone through. And their poverty, the poverty that they've been through, even though they were rich in the things of God. And also the blasphemy of those that say they're Jews or not. There's a lot of people that say they're something but you've got to be the real, the real deal, and God's going to test us and find out if we're going to really do what he says. He says, don't be afraid of any of these things. And he talks about how these ones were even going to have tribulation 10 days and be faithful unto death that he'd give them a crown of life. We never can compromise or draw back from the things of God. He goes on, and the next church he talked about again, knowing thy works each time. And we went through so many of these things, uh, which we really... I don't want to go back through all these again, but he also, in verse 19, he talks about their love, their service, their faith, their patience, and their works. These things are all important. God's looking at you, your love, your service of Him, your faith, your patience, which means steadfastness, and the works that you have been doing. And he talks about how he doesn't want Jezebels operating in the church, and there's a lot of them operating, unfortunately, and they're going to be in trouble. There's the, God always gives someone a space to repent, but if they won't repent, judgment's eventually going to come upon her, and that's what he speaks of. They're going to be cast in the great tribulation, except they pent, repent of their, their, their deeds. And all their children, which is speaking about all the ones who are following after Jezebels, are going to be in trouble. For the children are what they have produced spiritually. Kill her of children with death, and all the churches will know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts. One thing we do see, God searches your reins, which is speaking of the soulish realm, the area, the thoughts, feeling, purposes of the soul is what this is referring to. And then your heart. He's looking at you. What's going on in your mind? What's your purposes? What's your desires? What's your thoughts? What's going on in your heart? And he's going to give to every one of us according to our works because that shows your work show forth where your faith is. Your work show forth who you're following. And he talks about holding fast to these things that are important until he comes. And then we see down here we were looking at that he talked about these ones who, he said, I know thy works, thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. This is the person who's a Christian in name only, but he doesn't have any fruit. He's not carrying out the works. He's not doing the things that God says. You see, this is why God says to be a hearer and a doer of his word, not a hearer only. The hearer only has a great fall, but the hearers and doers stand strong and they built their house on a rock. Well, he says, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain, ready to die. God wants us to be watchful. We're to watch and pray, not give place to the enemy. We want to conquer in every area. 
and we're going to strengthen, we want to strengthen and get established, this refers to, set them fast, the things that remain. God wants the things of God set fast in your life so nothing can move you, nothing can cause you to draw back. You are not going to waver whatsoever. And he says, I've not found thy works perfect. The word perfect means to be filled up. It's a word, play, row. Shouldn't have been translated really this way because it's talking about fulfilled or fill or be full. That's what it's out of all these uses that you see down here. This is the number of usages in the authorized version. So 51 and 19, what, that's 70, 77 or so of these. Perfect is not what it, what it should have been translated. Young's brings it out very well, fulfilled. I've not found thy works fulfilled before God. What's that say? God's expecting our works to be filled before God. What works? We're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and work to do the things God wants. And we're to work the works of God. He's created us unto good works and we're to go forth and carry out the works of the Lord. See, so we're see, see these works be done in our life as well as in the lives of others. And he says, remember how you received and heard. We've got to think about what did you hear and receive at one point but we're not doing it now. And he says, hold fast and repent. He says, if you don't watch, because one of the problems we haven't watched, and we've let ourselves, the enemy come in and draw, cause us to draw away from things. He says, I'm going to come on you as a thief and you'll not know what hour I'll come upon you. See, this is talking about God's judgment that's coming upon the churches. And he even says, there's a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. God does not want us to defile our garments. How are our garments defiled? Through sin through the works of the flesh, through involvement with the world, doing things that are unrighteous, things that are contrary to his word. We cannot allow ourselves to be defiled. We're to put on the garments of God, not have defiled garments. The Bible even talks about in Jude about how we're to hate the, gar hate the garment, the flesh even being spotted, the spotting of the flesh, our garments being spotted by the flesh. We're to walk with him in white and be worthy before the Lord. You're worthy before him by your walk. And that is so important. Then he talks about, again, conquering. And then we see down here to the next church. He talks about how he set an open door and no man can shut it, and how they had a little power. God wants you to have power. And you are to get full of power. This guy says this, he's, he's happy with you have a little power, but really what God wants is us to grow and to develop the power of God in our life through the Word and become full of power. In Acts, they found those guys that were full of power, full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith, full of wisdom. Those are the ones that they appointed to do is just the work of carrying out the ministration to the, the, uh, the, he, the Grecian widows that were being neglected in the daily ministration. Well, God wants us to get the power of God in us. And keep the word of God and not deny his name. And the measure that you're hearing and doing the word is the measure that you're following the Lord. If we're not hearing and doing his word, then what are we doing? We must be doing something else. We're doing our own thing. And that's going to be a problem. Because, God's, because what's going to judge us? The Word's going to judge us. And God wants us, of course, to be full of His Word, walking in His ways, so we can, and it's going to be evidenced by the fruit in your life. Keep the Word of God. And he talks about keeping the Word of my patience, he says, and I'll keep thee from the hour of temptation that's going to come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That's the great tribulation. He's going to keep, you, you keep the word of his patience, he will keep you. He will keep you from this hour of temptation that's going to come upon the world. He comes up at, goes on and says, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast. He wants us to hold on to things, not lose what we've gained. He wants us to hold fast and bring forth fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Be continuing in the things of God, not lose what we've gained. So you can lose something you've gained and not see a reward. Talks about that in 2 John which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He talks about conquering and overcoming. Then we're talking about here, in the last one, where I know there works that you're neither cold nor hot. Would wish that you were cold or hot. Why? If you're hot, that means you're walking in the ways of the Lord. You're doing what he says. You're, you're following him fully. Cold means you're not, you haven't even come to, to anything of knowing him. You're not even at the place of of walking in his ways, he can at least reach you and hopefully bring you to the place of repentance. But he talks about the fact that these guys were lukewarm, as he says. Lukewarm is what? A combination of hot and cold. 
These are ones who had some of the things of God, but they also had some of the things that are cold. They had the sin, they had the world, they had the flesh, they had things that were not in line with God. You cannot have a mixture with God. He is a holy God. The mixture causes you to be profane. That's why we have to deal with all areas of sin in our life and walk uprightly. What's he say for the lukewarm? I'm going to spew thee out of thy mouth. Well, isn't that a little bit of the hot that kind of goes into the lukewarm okay? No, not according to God. The lukewarm gets spewed out of his mouth. He goes on and says, these guys, why were this way? They, they had their eyes on the temporal living and all the things they had. I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, I've needed nothing. He says, you're wretched, you're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They had all these things in the outward, in the natural, but spiritually, they were missing out on everything. And what did they need to do? They need to get the word, which is the gold tried in the fire. And you have to buy it. It's going to cost you something, not money. It's going to cost you time, effort, your life, giving of yourself, totally denying yourself and choosing the way of the Lord. <coughs> that thou mayest be rich. Because what are you to be rich in? Rich in the things of God, not in the things of this world. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. We want to be clothed with God's clothes. The shame of thy nakedness do not appear. <coughs> and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. He wants us to be able to see and discern things spiritually. Then he goes on and says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You've got to understand that God loves us, and he's going to come to correct us. He's come to chasten us, and he wants us, of course, to be zealous and repent and turn away from the things that are not of him. And that is so important. If we will do those things, then we're going to see the Lord's going to manifest himself. Because look what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, you hear his voice and you open the door. Open the door of what? Your heart to let him come in. You know, you can have a hard heart and not let God come in. We've got to have a tender heart, a yielded heart to him and receive his word. He says, I'll come into him and we'll sup with him and he with me. That's what God wants. He wants to come and to manifest himself in you. And of course, then we see the great blessing that will come to pass. So we see some very important things that we need to take note of. You know, the corrections that we see that he brought to them, and we really need to take heed to these things that he's speaking of. When he talks about the corrections, he says here that they left their first love. He also says, remember where you've fallen from and repent and do the first works. So you need to have the first love, you need to have the first works, as he says. He also talked about the fact that they needed to turn away from all the false doctrines, whether it was the Nicolaitans or the Balaam or Jezebel or any of these kind of things that were false, that were wrong. And also they couldn't be hypocrites. They were hypocrites. They were living a name, but they had no fruit. God is wanting us to have fruit, have power, have change. If we don't have change in our life, then we don't have the fear of God before us, it says in Psalms 55, verse 19. Therefore, he also speaks about how they didn't set fast and establish the things that they had, and they were dying out in their life. One thing, God wants you to be a hearer and a doer of his word. Take hold of what he brings to you. Put it into operation in your life. Incorporate it into your lifestyle so you're hearing and doing that word, and this is the way you live. And you're going to see fruit. And as you keep doing it, you'll see more fruit and much fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. That's what he wants in our life. And he also talks about the fact, as we saw, that your works weren't completed, your works weren't fulfilled. And that is so important. And we need to really dwell on this for a moment. Because every ca case he said, I know your works, I know your works, I know your works, I know your works. That means your works are important. A lot of people think, oh, I thought it was just me believing and just having faith. Well, that's important, but you know what? Faith without works is dead. That's what the Bible says. Remember, we've talked about that over in James, in chapter 2. If we don't have works of doing the Word, just having faith and believing is not going to do us any good. James 2.14 says, Though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? The answer is no. No way. It comes down to verse 17. Faith, if it has not works, it's dead. Being alone. It's got a, your, faith is not just something that is, I believe, if you believe, you're going to do what he says and carry it out. You know, someone tells you something, 
if you really believe what they said, you're going to go and do what they tell you to do. If they give you direction or advice or give you, tell you what something you need to do, you're going to carry it out. He says, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. How does God know that you have faith? By your works. You show your faith by the things that you're doing, the things you're saying, the things you're thinking upon, what you're putting your hands to, what you're spending your time in, in whatever you're doing in your life, and carrying out the things that God wants us to do. This means that your works are extremely important in your life. In fact, we see, just look at some scriptures for a few minutes that are important for you to understand. God says one of the foundations is to have the foundation of repentance from dead works. That means anything that is not a fruitful work, we need to turn away from it. Why waste your time doing unfruitful things? Because what's going to happen? They're all going to be judged, and if it abides, you're going to get a reward. If not, it's going to all going to be burned up, and you're going to suffer loss. It's going to, see, we don't want to have a bunch of things of hay, wood, and stubble that gets all burned up. No. We want to repent from the things that are not worthwhile. So you've got to realize that you're not here to live for yourself. You are to live unto him and not unto yourself. You are bought with a price. You have been redeemed. You're a purchased possession. You're not your own. In fact, we're to do the same thing that Jesus did. He did nothing of himself. In fact, let's look at that. In John chapter 5. Did Jesus come and just operate as God, doing whatever he wanted to do? No. In fact, Jesus even said out of his own mouth in John 5, 30, I can of mine own self do nothing. He did nothing of himself. As I hear, I judge. He says, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father that sent me. You can't seek your own way and follow the Lord. You can only seek the will of the Father and follow after him. Look at this testimony that he says in John 8, verse 29. He comes and he says, I always do, I do always those things that please Him, talking about the Father. Boy, that's a great testimony. That's what the testimony we want, that we do the things that please the Father. So we need to have repentance from the dead works, meaning we change our mind. But we're going to do more than just change our mind from them. We're going to get rid of them. Because Romans 13, 12 says, Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And put on the armor of light. Every work of darkness, you're to cast it off and get rid of it. And put on the armor of light and walk in the ways of the Lord. And furthermore, he didn't want you to have fellowship with anything. How are you going to conquer if you have this darkness or these evil things affecting you in your life? You're not. Ephesians 5.11 Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You don't want to have fellowship with them. That's why you're to be separate from those that are not walking in ways of the Lord. You minister to them, but that's not who you're going to fellowship with. No. You're going to reprove them instead. You're going to convict them. You're going to give them the word so that they can come to the place of repentance. And the Holy Spirit will work through the word you speak to convict them of the sin of walking in the wrong way. And teaching, of course, you're going to give them the truth. Same time, we can't have any of these works of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 tells us about the works of the flesh in verse 19, how the works of the flesh are manifest, all these things, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. These are all works of the flesh. Envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And then he says, of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, they're in trouble. That's why we turn away from all these things. Your works are important. In fact, what is God calling us to do? What are our works? What should our works be doing? Obeying what God tells us to do, always obeying Him. And He says, what are we to do? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You're going to work out your own salvation, your healing, your deliverance, your victory, the promises of God, the ministry that He's given unto you, all the things that He wants you to do in your life. And the word work out here is, again, it's not just I did it for a moment. No, it is a present tense verb, ongoing action. And this is just a suggestion. This is the imperative mood, and the imperative mood is a command. This is a command. 
God has commanded you and me to continually work out our own salvation with fear and trembling and do the things that he commands us to do. If we don't do those things, if we don't have those works, what are, what's that going to tell the Lord? Look what he says in Titus 1.16. It's quite a statement. They profess they know God. If you ask the normal Christian on the street, hey, do you know God? Oh, sure, yeah. I know God. I, I love God. And, you know, I'm born again and all these things. But in works, deny Him. If our works, we deny Him. He says we're abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate or not approved, not standing the test. See, God's coming to judge us. And you and I are conquerors, and He's bringing all these things out because our works are so important. We've got to conquer the enemy, and our works are going to show forth if we're really following the Lord or not. People that think, that, well, I can just go and do whatever I want to do. It doesn't matter. There are some, people, some Christian groups out there that teach, you're born again, you're going to heaven, everything's fine. It doesn't matter what you do. It's a lie. It's not the truth. It is totally contrary to the truth of the Word of God. <clears throat> he goes, so here, these guys are abominable, disobedient, unto every good work. They're not approved, not standing the test. What does the Lord want us to do? Hey, he wants to have us, as he says in Titus 2, 7, he says that in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Otherwise, you can see the working of God in your life, the things you do. You walk in love all the time. You know, you're rejoicing, keeping joy. Uh, you're walking in peace. You don't get in strife. You're long-suffering. You not have a short fuse and get a, you know, throw in the towel and write people off easily. You show forth goodness and gentleness. You show forth meekness. You show forth temperance. You're self-controlled. You know, you show forth all these fruit of the Spirit. You show forth the things that God wants. There's fruit in our life. That's what he's looking for. Well, verse 14 says, He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity <clears throat> and purify unto himself a peculiar people. We're to be purified, and what's, he gonna, what's that going to produce in us? We're going to be zealous of good works. We're going to be zealous to do everything that God wants us to do. We're going to be zealous not only to work out our own salvation and please Him in all things, but we're also going to be zealous to do the works of God to minister to other people because we want to see them get born again, receive the Holy Spirit, turn and repent, walk in the ways of the Lord, minister unto them in areas of their life. In fact, it's quite a statement he makes down here in chapter 3 in verse 8. He says this, There's a faithful saying, And these things I that I... I will that thou affirm constantly. It means if these things are to be affirmed constantly, this is constantly to be put before you. I want you to know this, know this every day, constantly affirming this, that those that have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Maintain. That means that's the way I'm going to live every day. I'm going to maintain the good works of God and do what he says. He goes on and says, Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Your fruit is all tied into your works. The things that you do are going to show forth fruit. You do the things God says, you're going to have fruit. How does God know us? He knows us through our fruit. That's why God wants us to be doing the things that He says. So your works are so important. And if we're not doing the things, what does He tell us to do? What did we see in Revelation? We see constantly he talks about repentance time and time again. Look what he says. Verse 5, remember from where you're fallen and repent. Repent means change your mind, change your ways, and quit doing those things. Verse 16, repent or else I'll come unto thee quickly to fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 21, he says it again. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. God will give you space to repent. You know, he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. He, he wants to, he's the God of mercy. At the same time, you know, you do have to repent. He doesn't wink his eye at sin any longer. The Bible says in Acts that he calls every man to repent everywhere. We see over in chapter 3, <clears throat> in verse 3, again, remember how you have perceived and heard, hold fast and repent. Change. You know, we've got to be changeable. We've got to be ready to change. We can't be just set in our ways. Human nature wants to be set in their ways and do whatever they want to do. Well, you don't walk by human nature. This is God coming into our life to change us and transform us so that we'll become like Him. We've got to be ready to repent at all times in our life. 
Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's what God wants. If we will repent and do what he wants, then we're going to come in line with walking in his ways. And then we're not going to be judged. And we're, instead, see, if you repent and you do what God wants, you're going to conquer. And you're going to carry off the victory. You're going to see God's blessing. In other words, you're either conquering or something else is conquering you. Sin, the flesh, the devil, the world. No. Remember, the devil's the one that comes at you, but greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You're able to, but you've got to put God into operation in your life. And the judgments that came against them, they're quite amazing. You know, people just kind of just pass these off. No. This is, this is the word of God, and it's absolutely going to come to pass. The judgment was he was going to remove their candlestick out of his place. That's the presence of God. That's like Ichabod, where the glory departs. Yeah, the presence of God not manifested. Verse 16. He talks about, I'm going to come and fight against them with the sword of thy mouth. I believe in fight against those, the ones that's talking about the ones who are holding the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and not doing what God expected them to do. Verse 22. He's talking about the Jezebel. He's going to cast her into a bed that committed adultery with her in a great tribulation, except they repent of their, their deeds. And their children be killed with death, and all the churches will know that I'm the one that searches the hearts and the, re and the reins. This is important to understand. God is a God of mercy, but he's also a God of judgment. And you must understand, before Jesus comes back, judgment will come to the church because there's going to be a separation. The Bible talks about a falling away that's going to occur. God's not will, God's will, but there'll be a remnant that'll walk with him, but unfortunately there'll be many that choose not the right way. Remember, he says you want to be one of the few, not one of the many. The few walk the straight and narrow. The many walk the broad way that leads to destruction. Here's the judgment. He says, I'm going to come on you as a thief, and you won't even know what hour I'm going to come on you. No. Don't think, well, the Lord won't bother me right now while I'm walking in the flesh or the sin. He might, you know. He, we, we, don't want to, we don't want to sit there. We need, we need to have the fear of God before us at all times. If you have the fear of God before you, you'll do the things that he wants you to do. And this is quite a statement that we see here where he talks about blotting out the name out of the book of life. That's a terrible judgment that would come for a person who is not doing what he says. And then he talks about the lukewarm getting spewed out of his mouth. God wants us to choose the way of the Lord. And we're going to have to conquer. And we're going to be able to conquer everything. We're going to conquer sin, we're going to conquer the works of the flesh, we're going to conquer the world, and we're going to conquer the devil, all the things that he brings against us. And you must realize that this warfare is a spiritual warfare against spiritual enemies. And this is what God expects of us. We want to look at some scriptures that are going to show you what God expects of what he will do to your enemies when you walk in his ways. Because you're to be the conquering church. We're to be in the conquering church, shown forth by the victory manifest in our life. Because Jesus made you more than a conqueror, not for you to get beat up by the devil. He made you more than a conqueror to conquer and, and accomplish and to see the Lord manifest everything. He wants you healed. He wants you delivered. And he is no respecter of persons. What he's done for one, he'll do for all. Absolutely. Hebrews chapter 11, down here in verse 33 who through faith they subdued kingdoms. Your faith can subdue the enemies. Wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant or strong and mighty in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. These guys did this in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. We're under a better covenant with better promises. We have authority over the devil. We can stop the works of the devil. God can do the same thing. He hasn't changed a bit. We see the fact that we're expected to conquer our enemies. In Numbers chapter 32, back in the Old Testament, verse 20, remember that they were told to go over and possess the land? And in order to go over and possess the land, they all had to get armed, didn't they? Moses said unto them, if you'll do this thing, if you'll go armed before the Lord to war, all of them had to get armed first, and then they had to go in and fight the battle against the enemies before they could take the land. You must understand that these things are important for us today because the physical 
are physical types and shadows of spiritual realities for us. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. Egypt's a type of the world. The physical promised lands type of the spiritual promised land, which are the promises of God. The physical enemies that were in the land that they had to conquer are a type of the spiritual enemies, which are the evil spirits that have to be conquered in our life. We have to conquer the enemy, and we're well able. So we've got to get armed. What kind of armor we're going to put on? Spiritual armor, the armor of God through the Word in us. And we're going to go to war. He says, if all of you will go armed over Jordan before the Lord until he's driven out his enemies from before him. Every one of us are to do this. The land be subdued before the Lord. That means you conquer it. Subdue means to conquer this thing, bring it under f with force and might to bring the enemies down. It says, afterward you shall return, afterward you shall return and be guiltless before the Lord, before Israel, and the land shall be your possession before the Lord. Look at that statement. You'll be guiltless before the Lord. That means if you don't do it, you'll be guilty before the Lord. If you do do it, you'll be guiltless before the Lord. That's quite a statement. He's expecting it's the same thing for us. We're going to be guiltless before the Lord if we go and we conquer and do all the things he says. And how is it going to happen, remember? See, would mean I've got to do it all by myself? No, you can do nothing of yourself. Who's going to do it? God's going to do it. Well, how is he going to do it? Through you. You have to be a participant through the Word of God in you and all the weapons he's given you. He's going to use you to conquer the enemy. He's going to work through you, through the Word and through the name of Jesus and by the Holy Spirit, the power of God, and you can conquer every enemy in your life. Well, we've got to be in the war, though. They had to go fight. Verse 29, Moses said unto them, If the children of Gad and the children of Reuben will pass over you with Jordan, every man armed to battle before the Lord, and the land shall be subdued before it, you shall give them the land of Gilead for possession. See, we're going to possess our land, which is the promises of God, if we will go and fight and destroy the enemies. That means we have to get involved in spiritual warfare. Doesn't the Bible speak in the New Testament of warring a good warfare and fighting a good fight? Absolutely. In Deuteronomy 9, verse 3, he said, Understand that, therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. When you're fighting your battles, who's doing it with you? The Lord. He is a consuming, as a consuming fire shall destroy them. He'll bring them down before thy face, so thou shalt drive them out. He's, going to, you know, he's given us the, the, the authority over all the devils, over every work of the enemy. And you and I now can destroy them quickly, as he says. He wants you to destroy the enemies as you cast them out and destroy all the works of the devil in your life. What did they do? Let's look at for scriptures for a few minutes here through the Old Testament. In Judges chapter 3, we see that these guys went and they obeyed God and they subdued the land. Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel. And the land had rest for score years. When they subdued the enemies, they had rest. That means, means when you subdue your spiritual enemies, what's going to happen to you? You're going to have spiritual rest, the promises of God, and you're not going to have all these tormenting things going on in your life. Look at chapter 4, verse 23. God subdued on that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the children of Israel. Then we see in chapter 8, God was the one doing it, but they had to go forth and fight. Midian was subdued, Judges 8, 28, before the children of Israel. So they lifted up their heads no more, and the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. That means you can come to the place of having peace and spiritual quietness in your life for years and years and years throughout your life. If we get the enemies put underfoot and defeated, why haven't we? Because we haven't wiped out the demonic network in our life that's come in from inheritance, our own sins, and victimization, and conquered the enemy in our life. Judges, we didn't know about it, see? Judges chapter 11. How did they do this work? They had to smite them all. You see him continually smiting them. He smote them from Aurora, even until they come to Minnith, even 20 cities. That's a lot of areas. Now, you might have a lot of areas. You might have 20. Cities are likened to areas in your life. You might have areas in your life, lots of areas. And they had to go and smite all of them systematically and drive them all out under the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter. And thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. Subdued, that meant they were conquered, brought underfoot, put in subjection. 
That's what God is going to do for your enemies. He's going to destroy them. They're going to be eliminated from your life. And you'll see that. For Samuel chapter 7, verse 13, look what he says. The Philistines were subdued. They were put underfoot. And what happened? They came no more into the coast of Israel. They didn't bother them anymore. Hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. He says the cities which the Philistines had taken, that means like the areas where the enemies come in and taken from you, you lost your joy, you got depression, you got anger, you got problems, you got hurts and wounds, you got bitterness, you got poverty, you got sickness, you got bondages in areas of your life. It says here, the Philistines had taken from Israel, they were restored. God is a God of restoration. He'll heal you, deliver you, and restore you. Ekron, even the Gath, the coast thereof, did Israel deliver, they got delivered out of the hand of the Philistines, and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. When God's at work, He's going to bring restoration, He's going to bring deliverance, and He's going to bring peace and victory for you in your life. We see over in 2 Samuel, again, how did they do this? They had to get into the warfare mode, didn't they? 2 Samuel 8.1, after this it came to pass that David smote the Philistines. How you smite them? With a sword. They're always doing that in the Old Testament. Why is that important for us? Because it's all types of what you and I do to conquer the enemy in our life, Satan with a spiritual sword, which is the word of God that we're speaking for, they're acting upon, coming out of our mouth. You're going to war with your mouth. And he subdued them. They got put underfoot. And David took Methagama out of the hands of the Philistines. We see down in 2 Samuel 22, what did, he, what, what did it take for David to do this? Here we see his psalm of thanksgiving. He tells you what I did. This is how David did it. He said in 2 Samuel 22, 38, I have pursued my enemies. The word pursue means to run after. And from a hostile standpoint, it means to run after with hostile intent to destroy them. I have run after the enemies. That meant he got on the offensive and went after them. Are you going after the devils to drive them out and going after everything that he's stolen to destroy his works? Or are you just sitting back there hoping maybe they'll go away? Hoping maybe God will take care of your situation. No, he told you to go after your enemies and to get rid of them. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I consumed them. He did not stop until they were eliminated. He was constantly in the warfare. I've consumed them and wounded them. They could not arise. That meant they were subdued under his foot. They're fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength to battle. See, God gives you the strength through his word to battle. You are able to fight that good fight of faith. You're able to war the good warfare. You're able to conquer the enemy. He made you more than a conqueror. Why? Because you're going to have to conquer, and you're able to conquer through the Lord. He says, those that rose up against me, thou hast subdued under me. All the things that have come against you in your life is the devil's rising up against you. What can you do about it? You can subdue them and smite them underfoot. And you're going to have to take the enemy on. And look what it says here about 2 Samuel 23, verse 9. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Aohite, one of the three mighty men with David. When they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. That meant this guy was all alone by himself. And it says he arose. What did he do? He didn't run from them. He arose and he began to smite the Philistines. He just didn't smite them a couple times and then that was it. No. He continued to smite them until his hand was weary. A lot of smiting. You're going to continue to cast out and just drive these enemies out. And you're going to get weary at times because there's a lot to drive out. But he kept on smiting them and driving them out. And his hand clave to the sword. That meant he didn't let go of the sword. When is your hand on the sword? When your mouth's in operation. Because what's the sword? Remember what it says in Ephesians 6? The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. The word for word is the word rhema, which means that which spoken, was spoken. So that means that your sword is in hand when your mouth is in operation, speaking to release the power of God acting on the word. His hand clave to the sword. And what happened? The Lord wrought a great victory that day. This is all a type of what he'll do for you. Every one of us, we have to arise. We've got to smite all the devils in our life. We're going to cast them all out. T times you might get weary but you're going to keep your mouth going, you're going to keep that sword in operation, and God's going to wrought a great victory for you, and you're going to see the victory. And will God just destroy a few of your enemies and then leave the rest of them for you? No. 
he will destroy them all. Look what he says in 1 Chronicles 17, 10. Moreover, I will subdue all thine enemies. That's the promise. That's what God will do for every single one of us. But of course, how did that have to happen? They had to get involved in the smiting process, didn't they? David smote the Philistines and subdued them. That's exactly what you and I are going to do. Why is that you see that continually through the Old Testament? It's driving this thing home to us. This is what you're going to be doing in your own life. You're going to be involved in warfare to smite the enemies. You're a conqueror. You're a part of the conquering church, and you are to rise and be a conqueror for the Lord. Nehemiah 9, 24. The children went in, possessed the land, subdued them for them. The inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, gave them into their hands, and the kings and the people of the land, they might do with them as they would. They went and possessed them and subdued them. They saw them be put underfoot. They took the strong cities. Say, well, this is too strong. I can't get this one out. Yes, you can. You can take it, no matter how strong they are. The greater one is in you. And a fat land, possess houses full of all goods, wells dig, vineyards, olive yards, fruit, tr fruit trees in abundance. What's that? That's great fruitfulness and blessing and prosperity. That's what God has for us. So they did eat, were filled, became fat in a good way, delighted themselves in thy great goodness. God wants to do great good things for us. You know, he's not holding anything back. But what was the problem with these guys? Well, they wouldn't listen. You know, we've got to really get submitted to do the things God wants. Psalms 81, verse 10. I'm the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open my mouth, thy mouth wide and I'll fill it. What are you going to do? You're going to start speaking and he's going to start releasing the power of God and smiting your enemies. But the people wouldn't hearken to my voice and Israel would none of me. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't do what I told them to do. So I gave them up to their own heart's lust. See, God's not, he can't make you do anything. He's given you a free will. And if we won't listen, he'll just let you do whatever you want. He gave them up to your own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Now, you know where that's going to end up with them. They're going to be destroyed. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. If they just had listened, and if they just had done what I said. That's what you're going to, you are going to tell you, at the end of your days, if you don't do the things God wants, you're going to look back and you say, if I just would have listened to God and walked in his ways, I'd have seen God accomplish all the things that he wanted in my life. I should soon have subdued their enemies. Remember, he's going to fill their mouth with what? The word of God and his power that's going to go forth and smite the enemies. And he says, if, you, if they would obey and done what I told them to do and go and fight and smite, smite those enemies, I'd have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. They wouldn't listen. No, we've got to listen. You see, God has put you in a position of authority. In the spirit you have authority over everything of the enemy. Jeremiah 1.10, I've set thee this day over the nations and over the kingdoms. You hear me pray this all the time when I'm praying the prayer for the nation. He set us over the nations and over the kingdoms. What are we going to do? We're going to root them out. We're going to pull them down. We're going to destroy and throw down all the works of these devils, these spirits in the heavenlies. It's a spiritual battle, remember. And we're going to build and plant the things of God as we speak these things into being to see God bring the manifestation of what he purposes. But who's he going to use to do it? Well, I'm waiting for God to do it. Well, that's not the way it works. The reason is because Jeremiah 51, 20, he says, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. You and I are the battle axe and weapons of war. You've got to engage. If you don't engage, it's not going to get done. As you engage in battle, God engages in battle. For with thee, that's you and me, Will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. That's why you and I got to pray. You got to pray prayers of authority. You got to get in there and do the work to draw, destroy these enemies and see them be put underfoot. Well, if you're going to be able to do that, well, how, how are you going to be able to do that? Well, you aren't going to be able to do it unless you're spiritually strong. Well, I want the Lord to make me spiritually strong. Well, what's he say? Isaiah 52, 1, awake, awake, put on strength. Whose responsibility is it? You're and mine. If you don't do what's necessary to put on spiritual strength, you'll never be strong. How are you going to get strong? Through the word. Put on strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. Holiness, walking in the way of the word. A holy city, for henceforth is no more to come unto the uncircumcised and unclean. No more uncleanness. 
We can't have any more sin, uncleanness, these things that are not of the Lord. They got to be eliminated. If the entire body of Christ was doing these things and standing up and proclaiming the truth and rebuking all the things that are going on in this nation, it would turn things around. But instead, we got a body of Christ that's backed in the corner, playing church, or having bless me club times, you know, and they're not even getting changes in their own life. They don't have the power of God on them to do anything. So you've got to be in the Word. Get the power of God. We've got to deal with ourselves. We've got to deal with all the uncleanness. How can we help any, somebody else come out of their uncleanness if we haven't dealt with our own? It's not going to happen, is it? God says you're going to put on, put on that strength. And what are you going to do with the strength? Well, you're going to put your mouth in operation. And what's your mouth going to be? Isaiah 49, verse 2. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Your mouth is not to be a destructive mouth against people, speaking negative, gossip, cutting them down, belittling them, you know, talking about all the evils and all this negative. Your mouth is to be put in operation to smite the enemies and destroy them in the realm of the Spirit. Your mouth is to be a sharp sword. And what are you going to do? You're going to enter into warfare. The intercessor, what's the intercessor do? Isaiah 59, 17 speaks of the intercessor. He puts on righteousness as a breastplate. The helmet of salvation upon his head. What's that sound like? That's the armor of God, isn't it? He put the armor of God on through the Word. What's he going to do with that? He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. You and I are going to have vengeance against our enemies. And it was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. It's payback time to the devils that have caused you problems in your life. It's time to drive them out. It's time to see the enemy be put underfoot in your life. Over in Joel, what do we see that it speaks of prophetically what's happening? This is gonna, it's happening here in the end times. Joel 2.11, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. You know, the Lord, he's not only walking in the church to see what the church is doing, examining it before the judgment comes, but he's also uttering his voice before his army, calling us. His camp is, camp is very great. For he is strong that executes his word. Are you to, how are you going to become strong? You're going to have to be a doer of the word. You are no stronger than the level of word that you're doing in your life. The guy who's strong is the one who executes the word. That is what he wants. And what's he say in chapter 3, verse 9? He comes down there and he says, Proclaim ye among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Prepare spiritual war. We are in a spiritual war. You're in a spiritual war. Things are going on in your life. We're in a spiritual war in this nation, in this world. It is a spiritual war, and you and I are going to fight that warfare and conquer the enemy. And see, the kingdom has been proclaimed. What's this gospel? It's a gospel of the kingdom. It's not a watered-down gospel. Just get born again and then forget about it and just go and just let everything happen in the world. No. Luke 16, 16 says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. The kingdom of God has come through Jesus Christ. And that is the rule and the reign of God. And you and I have been brought into the kingdom. Remember, we've been delivered out of the authority of darkness and translated into the kingdom of His dear Son, Colossians 1, 13. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, so we're supposed to be preaching it. Again, it can't be some watered-down thing. Not just receive Jesus, get born again, and then, okay, that's all you got to do. No. The kingdom of God, God's rule is coming into your life. It's not just to get you changed, get you born again. It's coming to get rid of everything that's of the devil in your life. All the sin, all the works of the flesh, all the world, all the devils. God's rule and reign is coming into clean house and to make you holy and make you fruitful and make you strong and make you mighty and bring forth promises and develop a personal relationship so that you're going to stand up and you're going to be a manifestation of the Lord in the earth. And no, look at every man. That includes all of us, doesn't it? Every man presseth into this kingdom. The word presseth is quite a word. In the Greek, it's a word biadzo, if you notice this below. And this word in the Greek means using force and violence. Every man uses force and violence to enter into an, the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God. Why? It takes spiritual strength and force and violence to conquer your enemy in your life. And if you're not going to be strong and forceful, how are you going to be able to overcome? 
God wants us to overcome everything. You can overcome depression. You can overcome mental problems. You can overcome sickness. You can overcome all poverty. You can overcome all these things that would come against you because the kingdom, the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ has come. And you know what? The kingdom is within you. It's going to operate through you if you and I will rise up and do what he says. So you and I are going to enter into it. In fact, we even see, look what it says over in Matthew chapter 11, about how we enter in and take dominion in the heavenlies. This is why we want to be engaged in warfare intercession. You know, many people, when they pray this, want to pray for their own needs. Well, it's great to pray for your own needs. How about praying for the other things that God wants? Yeah. Matthew 11:12. 12, in the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. What's that mean? The kingdom of heaven? Is that where God's dwelling? No, it's not talking about that. It looks like it. It looks like it's saying, hey, the kingdom of heaven is suffering violence. Something's coming against it. And the violent are taking the kingdom of heaven by force. So there's somebody coming and overcoming the kingdom of heaven? It's not talking about that. Why? Because the word heaven is plural in the Greek. Young's brings it out. Heavens is what it means. You can see this. This is the Greek text, SCM, which is Scrivener's text. This is the Greek word. You may not know Greek, but you can see it below. This is the Greek word. And notice, it's plural. Heavens is the word meaning heaven. Plural. They made a bad translation. All the translations, except for a couple, have translated it erroneously. It's heavens. That changes the whole thing. The kingdom of the rule and the reign of the heavens. What's that talking about? That's where all the demons are working at. The principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness, the spiritual wickedness, and the high heavenly places. The rule and the reign of the heavens is where the attack is. It is suffering violence. And who are the, who's bringing violence against it? The church. The intercessors that are rising up and coming against these spirits, the principalities, powers, rulers, darkness, casting them down, throwing them down, destroying their works. And the violent, that's you and me. Form of the word biadzo, but biastes, strong, forceful, are taking it, or seizing it, as this means, seizing it by force. If you're going to play, pray a little God bless me prayer, and that's all you're going to do, you're going to get nowhere. You're going to pray the word, and you're going to enter in the warfare, and you're going to take on the enemies, and you're going to drive them out. And of course, you're going to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, take hold of the promises, but you're also going to engage in the warfare. We need both. We can't just think that, well, I'll just pray and let God take care of everything. No, not when God told us what to do. We have got to engage in this warfare. In fact, look at these guys. This is what they were doing, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, over here in verse 25. He says, every man that strives for the mastery, you know this word striving for the mastery is the word agonizomai, which means to contend with adversaries. The guy who's contending with adversaries, that's what we're doing. He's going to be temperate in all things. That means self-controlled. He's not letting his flesh run him, because temperance is a force that keeps the flesh underfoot, so you don't let the flesh run you. He says, how am I doing? I'm engaged in this warfare. I therefore so run. Aren't we running the race? This race, looking unto Jesus? Not as uncertainly. I know where I'm headed. I know what I'm doing in the realm of the Spirit. And so fight I, I'm fighting, not as one that beats the air, no, I'm hitting the mark against the enemies in the realm of the Spirit. And we're destroying these enemies. God wants us to engage in the warfare. We see in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. This is a guy who was praying. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. What kind of laboring fervently was he doing? The word laboring fervently is the same Greek word, agonizomai, which means to fight and contend with the adversaries. He was always contending with the adversaries in the spirit in prayers so that they could get free and so that they could be perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's what an intercessor is going to do. And what does the Bible tell us to do in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12? Every one of us are commanded to fight the good fight of faith as well as to lay hold on eternal life. We're going to fight it. We're going to fight the good fight because we're going to conquer the enemies and we're going to see victory come forth. Well, when you're in the fight, there's going to be a, fight, a battle against you. <coughs> Where's the warfare? It's in the soulish realm, isn't it? 
It's coming against your mind, your will, your emotions. The battleground is in the mind and in the soulish realm. But what's the promise of God of what God will do? Psalms 55, 18 says, He has delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. That's right. Why? Because there were many with me. Who are the many with me? All the angels. The angels are sent forth to minister for us the heirs of salvation. What's going to happen? The angels are going to go in operation. When you speak forth the word, the angels are going to go forth to perform that word and fight against the enemies that you're coming against. Therefore, sure, you're going to have some pressure. The devil's going to, he's going to press you to try to get you to back off of the warfare. But we're, we're going through this light affliction, remember we talked about. We're going to press in and we're going to do the things that God wants us to do so we enter in. If you don't get the enemies put underfoot, and build the things of God in your life, this is what's going to happen. 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 3. Look what he says. Thou knowest how that David my father could not build a house unto the name of the Lord his God, for the wars that were about him on every side until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. He couldn't accomplish the building until the enemies were underfoot. And as long as he still had these wars that were about him on every side because he didn't conquer his enemies. He couldn't build the thing that he needed, what he's supposed to build. Now, the principle is this. We've got to conquer the enemies. Many people say, well, I'm sure I'm looking for God to do this and, and build all these things and bring forth the fruit and the promises. Remember the, the progression in order to possess the possessions? We talked about this in the past when we were looking at this. Over here in Obadiah, in verse 17. Upon Mount Zion, and Mount Zion's a picture of the conquering church, the conqueror, which is what you and I are to be. What's going to be first? Deliverance. Deliverance from sin, the flesh, the world, and all the evil spirits we cast out. What's second? There shall be holiness. That's going to be the result. What's evident of holiness? Fruit unto holiness. Remember in Romans chapter 6. And then what's going to be the result of that? The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. That's the promises. In other words, we got to get things in order. Deliverance comes first, which will produce holiness in your life, and then you'll possess the possessions of God. God wants to clean us up. We got to get delivered first so that we walk in His ways. Because if, until we do, we're going to have continual wars. Say, I'm tired of these wars. Well, don't be tired of the wars. Keep on fighting and put till the enemies are all put underfoot. You keep war in the good warfare. It's a good warfare because you're winning. It's a good fight because you're going to triumph over all these enemies, and they are going to be put underfoot. What happened? These guys did what they were told to do at one point here, and notice the testimony given about them. Joshua 11:23. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses. Joshua gave an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by the tribes, and the land rested from war. When you drive all the enemies out, you'll take all your promises, and you're going to be able to have rest, spiritual rest in your life. That's what God wants, and the land will be subdued under your foot. See, all these things in the Old Testament are all simply types and shadows of all these things. They aren't in there just to give you a bunch of history and waste a bunch of time. No, they're all spiritual revelations. They're all types of for Samuel 25, 28, he says, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. Now, why is he going to do that? Because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Now, that's to be our testimony. Because I'm fighting the battles of the Lord. These are not your battles, essentially. They're the battles of the Lord working through you against your enemies. God is fighting against your enemies. See, God's ready to fight against your enemies, but you've got to engage. He can't do it if you and I don't engage in the battle. Well, we're going to engage in the battle. So we'll say, I've been fighting, but I haven't seen any victory in some areas yet. What do I do? Well, here's a case where they weren't seeing victory, yet they were fighting. 2 Samuel eleven twenty five. 25, David said to the messenger, Thou shalt say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Otherwise, they were kind of losing in their battle. They weren't gaining ground. Make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it. What does God say? You've got to make the battle more strong. 
you've got to step up the battle. Well, I cast out once in a while. Well, that's about all you're going to get. Once in a while, help. How about stepping up the battle? How about engaging it day after day after day? Multiple times a day if you've got some serious stu stuff. I mean, I tell cancer cases, you start casting out all throughout the day and keep that cast out tape on throughout the day and rest when you're tired, get that thing back on and do multiple sessions and drive those enemies out till they're eliminated. That's what it's going to take because they're going to work against you. See, the enemies either, you have to understand. Remember when it said David was pursuing his enemies? Well, you also got to understand what's the enemy doing, the devil. He's not sitting by idly. Remember, it says the devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. <laughs> He's trying to devour people. Look what it says. The enemy said, I will pursue him. I'm going to overtake him. I'm going to divide the spoil. My lust will be satisfied. I'm all to straw my sword. My hand will destroy them. The devil's active to try to destroy you. All the things from inherited generational spirits have come into you that would cause physical problems. They're going to work like busy little bees to cause those problems if we don't get them out cancer in your generation, it'll be working and all of a sudden cancer shows up or diabetes or heart problems or whatever. Let's get after them and clean house on everything and drive them out so we can get healed and delivered and set free and stay in the battle until they're put underfoot. Two more scriptures. What is God going to do? If you and I will do what he says, this is the promise of God in the New Testament in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. He's going to bruise or crush him, break him in pieces. He's going to destroy every work of the enemy. Now, what's the we mean shortly mean? Boy, I hope it's a short time. It's not talking about that. The word shortly, when we put the cursor over it, you see this word in, which actually means with in this context, and there's another Greek word underneath it that unfortunately didn't get picked up in the King James. It is the word tacos, which means quickness and speed. In other words, it says, God, the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet with quickness and speed. It tells you how he's going to do it, not a time frame. So he's going to do it with quickness and speed, and how's he going to do that? Because you're going to do it with quickness and speed. You're going to get into the warfare. If you do it slowly, all he can do is do it slowly. If you do it with quickness and speed, he will do it with quickness and speed. Otherwise, God's not sitting around thinking, well, maybe I'll go do some things for you today when you're trying to get in the fight. No, you get in the fight, he's in the fight. He is ready. He is always on, ready to fight against your enemies and drive them out. So he's going to bruise, crush Satan under your feet with quickness and with speed. Praise God. And what's going to be the result? Our last scripture for the night, Revelation 21. Verse 7, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. This is in Revelation. This is, this, is after, this is talking about the end here. Overcome, again, the guy that conquers, carries off the victory continually. Present tense. This is the guy that's going to inherit all things. And I'll be his God and he shall be my son. That's what we want. We want to hear at the end of our days, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. We want to hear, yeah, you've been conquering and keeping my works unto the end. Have authority over the nations. We want to hear God speak a word showing the fact that, hey, we got, we've done what he wants. All our work's going to be tried, and they're going to be rewarded from it. We're going to get rewards. You see, you've got to realize all the things you're doing are, have eternal ramifications for them. Because all that, everything's, we're going to be all appearing before the judgment seat of Christ and given everything that we've done in our body, whether it's good or whether it's bad. People say, well, I didn't think that, that was so. I thought it was only all the good things. Nope. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it's good or bad. Well, that'll jerk the slack out of our life, won't it? <laughs> I don't think I want these bad things coming at me. Therefore, I said that was the last scripture, but somehow it got to this one. must have been the Lord. Praise God. What does God want? He wants us to conquer. You are well able. He's made us more than a conqueror. We've got to get with the program and drive the enemies out. Get rid of the sin. Get rid of the flesh. Get away from the things of the world. Cast out all these devils. Conquer them all. Receive the promises. Become holy before God. 
and watch God work mightily in your life. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that reveals what it is to be in the word to be a conquering church. I'm coming in line with the principles of your word and I'm going to engage in the spiritual warfare and I'm going to do what the word says and I'm going to repent from things that are not of the Lord and I'm going to walk in your ways and my works will show forth that I have been following you and they show forth my faith and when my faith is working the victory that overcomes the world is my faith and I thank you Lord I will continually conquer and carry off the victory and I will inherit all things and you will be my God and I will be your child thank you for bringing it forth as I'm a hearer and a doer of your word in Jesus name Amen praise God hallelujah I trust this has encouraged you same time give you some insight into what's coming down the road at some point in time when this judgment is going to come encourage you to really take hold of doing the things that God says because you and I God didn't make us a conqueror to get defeated he didn't say I'll give you the victory and then we don't get victory God's word is true let God be true and every man a liar he'll perform it in your life we just got to get wholly committed and come in line with it God's never the problem it's either us not doing the word or it's the devil that we haven't eliminated. A lot of times that we haven't eliminated the devil yet. That's why we've got to get engaged in the warfare and get delivered from every enemy in our life. Praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you for all that you brought forth. Thank you as each one of us is here and a doer of the word. It will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen.